interesting thing this week. I was reading. <laughs> and the preface of the book that I was reading reminded me of a story. The setting is about 70 AD. The temple has just been destroyed by the Romans. The Romans had decreed that it is illegal to study the Bible, and it is a crime punishable by death. There's a man. His name is Rabbi Akiba. In an act of defiance against the Romans, in an open courtyard, he assembled. Scholars say it was between 20 and 25,000 people that he gathered and began to preach Torah. Another rabbi, seeing what he was doing, and came to him and said, what are you doing? Do you not know that you can be put to death for the things that you're doing right now? Can't you just at least meet in secret? Rabbi Akiba responded with this. So let me give you an answer with a parable. There's a fox that went to a stream to get a drink of water. While he was there, he seen a group of fish frantically swimming away. So the fox asked the fish, what are you swimming away from? The fish looked back at the fox and said, we're fleeing the fisherman's nets. The fox said to the fish, why don't you just come up here on land? Why don't you just escape the fisherman's nets and escape? I'll, could, I'll put you in hiding here on land. And the fish said to the fox, would you rather us depart our source of life in order so that we can fill your belly, or should we escape and, fill, and escape the belly of the fisherman? And with that, he turned back to his congregation and began again to preach Torah. So let me ask you this. Is this the source of our life? When we're separated from the word of God, do we feel like fish out of water? Or are we most comfortable when we're away from the scripture, doing life our own way? As it happened, the Romans caught on to what Rabbi Akiba was doing. And... He did not make it through the, the lesson that he was working on before the Romans swooped in, captured him, and escorted him to the dungeon. Incidentally, that rabbi that also tried to stop Rabbi Akiba from preaching the gospel was arrested by the Romans and put to death for a less, a more trivial matter, a less important matter. It came time for the day of reckoning. Rabbi Akiba was to carry out his, or get his sentence carried out, he was to be put to death. His clothes were stripped from his body, he was beaten, and he began to sing praises to God. It angered the captain of the Roman legion so much that he commanded his soldiers to flay Rabbi Akiba alive. His singing grew all the more greater, the deeper the swords got thrust into his skin. And this astonished the captain of the guard, who asked, Why do you sing praises to your God? You're supposed to be suffering. Rabbi Akiba responded, he said, I must love the Lord my God with all my soul. It doesn't matter what you do to me here on this earth. Because this momentary pain is going to send me to everlasting with my Father in heaven. Amen. And the last words Rabbi Akiba uttered upon this earth was the Shema. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Chechad. Hear, O Israel. The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And then his soul left his body. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. 
So to summarize last or two weeks ago, our faith is going to be put to the fire. What's our response going to be? Is our response going to be one of defeat, of one of separating ourselves from Scripture? Are we going to be like one of the two rabbis? Are we going to, are we going to follow in the Lord's footsteps and say, I must in my soul follow God? Or are we going to say we must hide and escape the persecution that, that might follow? What's our response going to be? But when we lack wisdom, when we don't know what footsteps to take, God gives us our wisdom in James chapter 1 to recap it. Who gives without holding anything back from it. Who will help guide us and direct us as long as we act in boldness with what he tells us to do. And then we get to verse 16 in chapter 1, where we're told, do not err. When we're tempted by the devil, we've asked for God's wisdom. We know what the right action to take is. James, James finishes that section up by saying, don't err, don't depart from the way. So let's look at our key verse for evidence or faith evidenced by works. It's going to be found in James chapter 2, verses 17 through 19. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith, and I will show you, or without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. Let's go to the Father in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for being sovereign. Thank you for guiding and directing us. Thank you for giving us your wisdom. Father, thank you that no matter what we're going through in life, we can always reach out for you. Father, as we enter into this time of studying your word, we pray that you be among us. Fill us all with your spirit. And Father, let the words that come out of my mouth be glorifying and edifying to you. And Father, let it bless those that hear it. In Jesus' name, amen. So that's about as far as we got two weeks ago with the recap. So let's go back to James chapter 1. There's a difference between hearing the word and doing the word. We read in James 1, 19 and following, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness or malice, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. Verse 22, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass or in a mirror. He beholds himself and goes away and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. He forgets what he looks like. And 25, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein in sin, he is being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word. So don't, don't be a hear, hearer and continue in sin. Be a doer and be saved. Sin no more. But a doer of the word, continuing in 25, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Verse 26. 
If any among you seem to be religious, and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own self, this man's religion is in vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. This concept seems self-explanatory. We either do what the word says, or we lie to ourselves. And then when we lie to ourselves, we also lie to each other. But when we're doers of the word, we're blessed by God, and oftentimes are given more to do. But God stays faithful and blesses his work. If we are hearers only, we come to the church on Sunday, we give God his one-hour allotment, step out of here and back into the sins Jesus saved us from. Verse 23, let's go ahead and go back through this a little bit. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, who beholds himself and goes away and forgets what he looks like. What does it mean to be a doer of the word? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ on mission with God? God has a mission, does he not? God has a calling for each one of us in the church, does he not? And we must each do our part following our calling, following what God has told us to do to continue on in his work. And that's how we turn Mountain Home upside down for the cause of Christ. But now let me touch on this. What does it mean to bridle our tongue? We've got to watch what we say. There's three times in the book of James that we, we learn about taming our tongue. And for a moment, I'm going to derail us, and let's look at Genesis chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 9 through 13. This is when they had the angels appear unto Abraham, and God delivered this promise. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. Verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return thee to accordingly to, uh, to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard this in the tent door which was behind them. And Abraham and Sarah now were old and stricken with age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of woman. She was beyond the childbearing age. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. She laughed in her head, saying, After I am waxen old, shall I, have, shall I pleasure my Lord, being also so old? Verse 13, And the Lord said unto Abraham, So who received the judgment for Sarah laughing in her head? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child, which I am old? So let me ask you this. Men, are we ready to accept the consequences and the judgment of the words that our wives have spoken? Or the things they have thought? Especially when things turn sideways. Women, what kinds of things is your man going to be judged for? You see, when when we consider it pure joy, whenever we face trials of many kinds, the things that come out of our mouth are indicative of our walk with God. Let's look at this in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For of the thorns of men do not gather figs, nor do the bramble bush gather the grapes. So we know, we know a tree by its fruit. We know what, what kind of a tree it is by its blooms. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth that which is good, and an evil man, 
out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. When things go sideways, what do you say? What are you full of? If you're full of hate and angst and backbiting, what are you full of? But if you're full of love and goodness and mercy and self-control, what are you full of? When Jesus was nailed to the cross, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. What was he full of? What does it mean to be a doer when our faith is put to the fire? And that's what the rest of James is really all about. Contrasting what it means to be a doer and what that really looks like. In chapter 2, we're going to read about the sin of being a respecter of persons rather than a respecter of God. James 2, chapter 1, or chapter 2, verse 1. My brethren, do not have faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto you in your synagogue or in our church a man with a gold ring and splendid apparel, and a poor man also comes in and veil apparel, he doesn't look very good, and you look upon him who wears the splendid apparel and say, Thou sit here, you do well. And you say to the poor, Do not even stand here or sit under my footstool. Do not even come into my foyer. Are you not partial in yourselves and are becoming judges of evil thoughts? Verse 5. Hearken, my beloved brethren. Has not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to them that love him? But you have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? Do not they blaspheme the worthy name by which you are called? Don't they blaspheme the name of God? If you fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself and you do well to do so. So here we have loving our neighbor as ourself is the next thing that we can do to be a doer of the word. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convicted of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend one point is guilty of it all. Verse 11. For he that said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not kill. Now if you commit no adultery, yet if you kill, you have been a transgressor of the whole law. Jesus didn't die just for those that we wished would be saved. He died for everyone, for God so loved the cosmos in the Greek. He loved the world. How do we choose those that we evangelize and try to win for the cause of Christ? Do we try to look at those that seem worthy enough for us to talk to them? Or do we talk to everyone that we encounter? How do we select those we'll sit with in church? Is it those that look like us, smell like us, dress like us? Or is it everybody? Should we, should we engage with everybody that comes through these doors? How do we select those that we're going to minister to? When we ask God to break our hearts for the things that breaks his... Treating those that look well off better than everybody else breaks the heart of God. It tells people that they are not worthy of the blood that was shed for their sin. How dare we pass that message on? How dare we represent God in that way? We are all offenders of the law and all in need of salvation and the only one that can change anything about that is Jesus Christ. Jesus, our Messiah. Faith without works is dead. We get to verse 20 in chapter 2. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham, in verse 21, our father, justified by what he did when he had offered his Isaac, his son, upon the altar? 
And the Old Testament is filled with God commanding, man obeying, and God saying, and it was seen unto him as righteousness. No, it's another one that comes to mind. I'm also going to take a pause. If you follow in the Old Testament, where Abraham was commanded to sacrifice his son, and then the angel came in and swooped in and stopped the hand before the knife got thrust into Isaac, What we overlook is sometime later, in that exact spot, another man would be sacrificed. Another father would give his son in that exact same spot. The spot that Jesus was crucified on is the exact same spot that Isaac was commanded to be killed. And God provided a scapegoat then for Isaac, and he provided a scapegoat in that exact spot for us. Every name, every place name, every number is in this book for a reason. Do we know why they're there? Moving on to 22. Seest thou how faith wrought his works, and his works made him perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him, it was given unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. See, when we do what God tells us to do, when God tells us to do it, and we walk in joyful obedience, regardless of how uncomfortable it may be for us, we'll be blessed and called righteous. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot in verse 25 also justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. James gave us a few examples here and we already talked about Noah. What about the faith Mary had to have to give birth to the Lord Jesus Not having known any man, but having that kind of judgment cast down upon her. Jesus being called illegitimate. The disciples had faith and turned the world upside down. We claim to have faith for Southern Baptist Church. As my mother always said, the proof is in the pudding. What works do we have as a church here in Mountain Home? If people looked at our lives that we live when we're away from here, away from this place, what would they say our life consisted of? Works of grace or works of hate? Homiletically, or the personal application of this, what works do we have individually? In many churches, 90% of the work is done by 20% of the people. Everyone else expects the ministry to be done without contributing to it at all. Are we a church where the work abounds, but the laborers are few? How about after Pastor Jim and Sarah are gone? Will the work continue? Two nineteen, Thou believest that there is one God, and you do well. The devils also believe and they tremble. Faith alone doesn't cut it. If faith alone could save, the devils would be saved as well, right? But they're not. Now, it's easy to get caught up from this in a works-based faith. But that's also swinging the pendulum in the complete wrong direction. Before we move on, let me ask you this. I'm going to reiterate this point. What does it mean to be on mission with God? What has God called you to do? And delayed obedience is disobedience. What has God called you to do that you're being disobedient in? Moving on to chapter 3. Spiritual maturity requires us to tame the tongue. Verse 4. Behold, also the ships which... Though they be so great and are driven by fierce winds, yet they they are turned about with a very small helm, wheresoever the governor listeth. 
So wherever the captain of the ship decides the ship to go, you steer this little rudder on the back end of the ship, and it steers the entire ship in that direction. Even so, the tongue is a little member, in verse 5, and boasts of great things. Behold, how great a matter a, matter, a little fire is kindled by our tongue. And in verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on a fire of hell. Verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of thing in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind by the tongue. But the tongue no man can tame. It is unruly, it is evil, and full of deadly poison. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And when the mouth speaks, it directs the rest of your body. Where is your tongue telling your body to go? If we say we love God and use our tongue in a way that cuts down and is full of deadly poison, which is more true of what's inside? Well, we can look to James for the answer. James chapter 3, verse 9. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith we curse men, which are made after the similitude, after the image of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not be so. Verse 11. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter water? Does it send forth good water to drink and poisonous water to drink from to kill you? Verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear on olive berries? Either a vine fig? So no, or can no fountain yield both salt water and fresh water? We claim to be one with God as a member of the body of Christ. Our tongue ought to reflect, and I will say it does reflect, our walk. Either we're walking with God, or we're on a troll with the devil, a stroll with the devil, and our tongue reveals the secret. Who does our tongue we walk, say we walk with? Even better, when you can hide behind the anonymity of social media, what does your fingers say you walk with? Right. Words that are written with modern technology don't actually need to say anything. And yet we can cut people down with our fingers just as much as we can cut people down with our tongues. That's right, brother. Come on. So what are you full of on social media? Moving along, is our wisdom from God? James 3.13 Who is a wise man that endured with you, knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where er envying and strife is, there is the confusion and every evil work. 3.17 But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, and easily to be irritated and, tre and treated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. You see, James here is reiterating the fruits of the Spirit. Verse 3, 318. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that makes peace. We read in 1 John 4 to test the spirits. In verse 1, 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye 
that the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come from God in the flesh, verse 3, and every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come from the flesh and is not of God, and this is what the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Here we have an example from James that if there is bitterness, envy, strife, selfish ambition, the wisdom that we're walking in is not from God. And we shouldn't act like it is. It is earthly. It is unspiritual. And I would say it's even demonic. For where there is envy and strife, there is every evil work. You hear me say to walk in wisdom, it's critical to know whose wisdom we're walking in. God's or the devil's. But in verse 17, the wisdom from God is pure, it's gentle, it's peaceable, it's full of mercy and full of good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown, I peace of them that make peace. What is evident here? Tied to Jude, a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Let's look at James 4, 2. We're kind of cruising through this a little bit. This is good. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. You adulterers and adulteresses know ye not that the friendship of the world is enemy with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is to be the enemy of God. Verse 5. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusts to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 4.7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy turn to heaviness. Verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Verse 11. Speak not evil of one another, brethren. He that speaks evil of his brethren and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou judgest another? What makes us think that holy God will bless unholy living? When we are silent about the lifestyle God calls an abomination, when we are so full of envy that we would curse the image bearer of God, when we're so full of envy that God would bless another, when we are friendly to the devil's way, but pray to God for his help. What makes us think that God will bless those contrary to his will? We covered that pretty significantly in Jude. So I'll just leave that there. But I'll I'll just leave it there with this question. Do your works evidence faith and trust and walking with God? Or are your works pleasing to Satan? Let's move on to James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. See, when when life throws us curveballs, when our faith is put to the fire, 
when the devil has given us a, a snare to walk into, if we resist it, he will flee. Don't we see this with Jesus? When, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, the devil showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world and said, bow down to me and I will give this all to you. You know, that wouldn't have been a temptation unless he could actually deliver on it. See, if I said, Pastor, let me sell you the Golden Gate Bridge, give me a down payment, and I'll hand you the title deed, is that even a temptation for you? No, I don't own it. I can't give that title deed. But it was a temptation that God had to endure that Satan could actually deliver on, or it wouldn't have been a temptation in the first place. But he resisted the devil by quoting scripture, Deuteronomy. How well do we know our sword to resist the devil and cause him to flee from us? What does the future hold? What does James say about it? James 4.13 Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such city and continue there a year and by such and sell and get grain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and does it not, to him it is sin. Why do we choose to rejoice in the future without being thankful for the present? Here, James is telling us that we should be living each moment for the Lord, not looking past the mission God has given us to do in the moment, and looking toward what may happen next week, next month, next year. James calls it a sin to rejoice in what may or may not happen in the future. Are we told someplace else to store up for yourselves treasures in heaven? Matthew 6. Let's move on to James chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Go to now, you rich men. Weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were a fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, to hire the laborers who have re reaped down your fields, which is of, of you, kept back by fraud. And they cried with the cries of them which have reaped and entered into the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath. You have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed the just, and, doth, and he doth not resist you. Let's review a couple of verses from Matthew in passing. Matthew six nineteen. I've already kind of referenced it. Let's dive into it a little bit. Lay up for yourselves, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break in or steal. Where are we as a church, as a people, and as a nation? The so-called American dream dictates that he who dies with the most toys wins. We need the biggest. We need the best. We need the most. And we need the most expensive thing and anything less means you're not well off. If Mr. Jones gets a bigger truck, a faster car, a house upgrade, we need to keep up or get left behind. What does Matthew 19.24 say about that? And again, I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Some say that this is an inner door, a smaller gate in Jerusalem that a camel can be unloaded 
forced to crouch down and men pulling at the front and pushing from the rear and getting them through the gate. I have a problem with that concept. It doesn't matter how far we crouch, how much we struggle, if we try to get into the kingdom of God on our own accord, we cannot do it. We cannot struggle enough. We cannot cause ourselves to suffer enough. The hole is not big enough for us to crawl through. For Jesus is the only way. So I think this passage is talking about a literal camel and the literal eye of a sewing needle. We cannot enter into the gate without Jesus. He's the only way. So how possible is it for the wealthy to realize their need for Christ? Well, Jesus gives us that answer. It is easier for a literal camel to pass through a literal sewing needle. than for someone to realize that they need to look for a rescuer. Look no further than the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler. Let me start saying my, my words here. Everything we amass here on earth is made of wood, hay, or stubble. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 3.12. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort that it is. 14. If any man's work abides which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so saved by fire. Excuse me. Our faith will be put to the fire and what remains will be either blessed or consumed. Consider it pure joy, therefore, my brothers. 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells within you? If any man defile the temple of God, him God shall destroy. For the temple is of God, it is holy. Which temple ye are? You are the temple. Which of our wealth will survive the test of God's holy fire? The degrees we've gotten? The certificates we've accomplished? The cars we drive? The houses we live in? What's going to survive the fire? All of the things of this world... And all the things that the world says success is shall be made as nothing. Let's look towards the end of the Bible at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall say, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Let me ask you this, why is God drying tears? This is after the formation of the new heaven and the new earth, where already the saints have been captured up with God, the wedding feast is over. Why is God drying our tears? What pain will we have in glory? How about the realization that we stored up the wrong treasure? The missed opportunities God gave us to reach the lost. How about the work we thought we were doing for God, but is also consumed by the fire? Spiritual maturity here and faith evidenced by our works is realizing that our wealth means nothing. It is good to be blessed by God, don't get me wrong. But how much better is it to enter into his courts with praise rather than tears? How much better to focus on the God that gave the blessing rather than elevating the blessing above the one that gave it? And let me just say this. I read a statistic uh, some time back 
that even America's homeless are in the top 1% of the global income. How rich are we as a nation? How much has God blessed us? Do we wonder why our, our, our nation thinks they don't need a rescuer? Do we wonder why we don't think that's, that we need God to come in and save us from our sins as a nation? Is it any wonder why we are as lost as we are as a nation? And what are we doing? What work has God given us to do to go and show them they need a Savior, to go and witness to those that need saved, and to bring the lost to reconciliation with God? And a gift that only you can do. God gives you gifts according to His will that you can go and help be God's face to those that are lost. What are we doing with the abilities, with the talents, with the gifts, with the call that God has given us specifically to do. Some are called to be feet, some are called to be hands, some are called to be mouths. God gave us each our own ability and gift. What are you doing with it? Then James moves back to suffering. We're back where we started from. Again, James exhorts us to suffer well. James 5.8. Be also patient. Establish, literally, strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord draws near. Grudge not against one another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge stands before the door. 5.10. Take my brethren the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. I'm reminded of that story I began with, with Rabbi Akiba. Who can hold a grudge better than a Christian? It's astonishing to see people that should be respected leaders in the church marred by holding a grudge over somebody else. I have seen the fruit of a church grudge that has lasted for more than 30 years. The division, the hate, the despising, and the people that get so old they forget why they hate each other in the first place. (laughs) I don't know why I hate you, I just do. And yet, they still hold the grudge against each other. And they went to the grave full of hate for the other person. Do we suffer with the same steadfast devotion that Job did? Notice, you know, Satan killed off everybody except Job's wife. So either knowing or unknowingly, Job's wife was doing the devil's work. Why don't you just curse God and die, Job? Just get this affliction over with. See, had Job's wife been on board... With Job suffering well, she probably would have been gone too. James 5.11, getting back to our text. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and tender and full of mercy. Mature Christians pray prayers God hears. 5.13, is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing psalms. Is any sick upon you or among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall, be raised up, shall raise him up. And if ye have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. 516. Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We can achieve much when our prayers actually reach the ears of God. It is possible to pray prayers that don't even reach the ceiling. 517, Elias was a man subject to walk like passions as we were. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not upon the earth. By the space of three years and six months, And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. 
519, brothers, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which covereth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And he shall hide a multitude of sins. How many of us pray prayers of intercession for each other? How easy is it to get caught up in our battle and pray for ourselves and keep God to ourselves? When's the last time we focused on prayer for each other? When was the last time God put someone on your heart to pray for and you actually went on your hands and feasts before God praying for the person the Lord said needed prayer? 5.15 says, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, shall be forgiven him. See, God hears the prayers of faith, not the prayers of showboating. Proverbs 15, 25 says, The Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. He that is greedy of grain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pour out evil things. 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he heareth the prayers of the righteous. In my sermon in Proverbs, I went to great lengths to discuss the subtext in the Proverbs. What's the subtext here? Can we claim to be Christians? Can we claim to be saved and saved for a long time, yet be considered wicked before God? Those God considers wicked, he remains far from. You see, God cannot commingle with wickedness. God and sin cannot, cannot live together. But the prayers of the righteous are sweet to his ears. What does our prayer life say about our righteousness? How many thought our prayer life, or thought of our prayer life as works evidenced by faith? And our lack of prayer displays a lack of faith. What is, the, what is our prayer life as a church? Every Thursday night we have an hour of prayer. The last time I was there, there's only five of us. Does that indicate faith evidenced by works? Does that indicate a lack of faith? Or does that misrepresent the faith of the church? James 2.20 to reiterate. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead. What works evidences a dead faith? And what faith represents faith that is alive and thriving? What are our works individually and as a church? Do we watch the things coming out of our mouth? Do the things coming out of our mouth bless the ears of God? Do we suffer well? When our faith is put to the fire, do we withstand the fire? And when we know, when we realize that we can't withstand that fire alone, we ask to God for his wisdom to help us, to guide us, to direct us? Or when the fire comes, are we consumed? There's a lot of intangibles here. But the intangibles lead to the tangibles. If we walk in God's wisdom, we will know what footstep to take. We'll know who to talk to. We'll know what to do. We'll know what wisdom is. And do we walk in wisdom with God or with wisdom from the devil? Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you for showing us the way, what it means to live righteously, 
and the encouragement to resist the devil and the promise that he will flee when we do. Father, help us to withstand the fiery darts of the devil with your armor. Help those around us to see you at work in us. Father, help us to be so full of you that even the sinners that see us, even the lost that see us, will want to know what we have. Help us to be so full of you that the works that we do are very clear works from you. Father, give us wisdom. Give us guidance. And give us direction. Help us to know which footsteps to take, which direction to walk in. And help us to walk in righteousness. Father, help us to be so full of your spirit that we can't possibly so be so full of anything else. Help us, Father, to be known by our love for one another. By our kindness. By our mercy. And help us to reflect you to the fallen world. Father, You created us the first fruits of your creation. Help us to treat people as such. Help us to love people as you love people. And Father, break our hearts for the things that break yours. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus, our Messiah and our Savior. Amen.